namaste and greetings from indic academy to uh, ms radha mehta from uh, gujarat she has come for the international oriental conference and um, by profession she is a public speaker and public motivator i would say so it's really fantastic to i mean it's a very unusual uh, field and you say there's a culture of uh, speaking on, in on motivational topics and bharatiya related topics in gujarat yes. so could you tell us something more about that and how did it start in your interest so uh, it started like any other student uh, i used to participate in allocation competitions and i used to win the you know school level district level state level then i was in 7th grade and i was uh, sent to the national bal bhavan at mm-hmm. delhi and i won a national symposium competition there and then became i belong to you know small town uh, a community where you know almost everyone knows everyone mm. so i was suddenly this local star <laughs> or something at a national level mm. so people started inviting me in the nearby areas uh, then uh, our pm uh, who was the gujarat cm back then he was coming to junagadh my mm-hmm. hometown so our collector and commissioner they collectively decided that uh, while the honorable cm is visiting we want to represent the city junagadh through this kid mm. so i was 14 years old and i was put on the stage mm. where uh, he was sitting all the other leaders were there and i delivered a lecture on the rich cultural heritage of junagadh and then some of my videos went viral even before uh, social media was a thing mm. like in 2009 10 mm. so people started inviting me and i enjoyed it a lot i enjoyed talking to people connecting to people and teaching people so i started delivering lectures professionally and now it has been years since mm-hmm. i do that so i love that yeah so when when you spoke about your uh, hometown to in front of uh, uh, modi ji uh, what were the things that you uh, emphasized i mean see as a youngster what you talk about a value system mm-hmm. is different from a value system of a politician or a, a some other profession so what were the things that were important to you at that stage so at that stage my perspective was majorly focused on highlighting the uh, cultural heritage in terms of like physical heritage architectures and temples and everything as well as the emotions connected to that mm-hmm. so um, junagadh is you know a very lesser known site with rich heritage we have the very famous girnar kshetra there with datatrey bhagwan's temple uh, we have buddhist culture and influence there because a lot of both the monks mm-hmm. stayed in junagadh they had their caves and their ecosystem there we have the inscriptions by ashoka mm-hmm. there uh we have a lake called sudarshan sarovar which is the very first authentically proven the most ancient uh structure mm-hmm. man made structure mm-hmm. of uh, gujarat and maybe probably india mm-hmm. so sudarshan talab is i don't know uh, how old mm-hmm. but we had a lot of heritage sites which were a little neglected because of the unpopular unpopularity of those sites so then uh, the cms are also appreciated it at within a week we had the uh, tour gujarat tourism ads being shot there with bachan wow. saab there and it was a big thing so yeah i felt like chalo i've done something yeah, nice for my yeah. town yeah. so um now when when you choose topics now i mean what are the things that are of concern uh, to you now uh right now i choose topics that connects indian culture and ancient knowledge to some modern perspectives because i feel that uh, when we deny to change the perspective the audience will not connect to that because we live in an era where even films for 3 hours sound boring to us we live in uh, the era of a 20 minutes episode or maybe 30 seconds reel a 1 minute video so i try to connect the dots of these things and i think it is very interesting mm. because uh, the word philosophy sometimes feels like a jigsaw puzzle mm. that some piece of indian philosophy would connect to some piece of western philosophy or some piece of indian story narrative or philosophy would connect with some hollywood film uh, or some poetic lyrics mm. from bollywood or something else 
so my focus remains uh, upanishad centric uh, advaita vedantic but i try to cover uh, the wider aspect mm-hmm. or expand the horizons of my references no uh, fantasy we had a series called the travel of ideas so we were uh, exploring how now of course we have the internet and mm-hmm. digital age so the way ideas travel is pretty straightforward and easy but uh, how did ideas travel maybe you know 200 300 500 thousand years ago from the, the path is not very uh, clear and also the study of it is not very clear how do you study something that happened you know and is you had ripples in another uh, country so when you talk yes your talk yesterday it talks about uh, somebody who existed you know long back to a modern film uh, what was the basis of your uh, saying that this the the causal relationship uh, or do you establish causal you know that this influence that mm-hmm. or do you just say that this uh, has similarities what so, is the relationship so uh, i have observed both kinds of cases where sometimes a western creator mm-hmm. creator because they they might be a book writer they might be a filmmaker uh, or they might be a poet sometimes the western creators do acknowledge that they have studied indian philosophy or they have had some influence of indian philosophy sometimes it's just a mere coincidence mm-hmm. so my paper was about gaudapada acharya's philosophy and christopher nolan's film inception now inception has won four academy awards and it's a widely popular and critically acclaimed film uh nolan itself himself is a celebrated filmmaker but i went through his interviews his uh, published interviews like in written format uh his shooting script acknowledgement everything nowhere has he mentioned anything about indian philosophy the study of it or any kind of influence of it so sometimes i feel like it is a it is an example of ano bhadraha krata voyantu vishvata that they, they might have received the same kind of thoughts Mm-hmm. so uh that might be the case in some mm-hmm. aspects but in others yes i think indian philosophy do inspire a lot of uh, modern day creation mm-hmm. see there is this uh, phrase called cultural appropriation mm-hmm. where they are taking ideas from yeah. us and not uh, giving credits <laughs> yeah not giving i wish yeah. happening yeah. a lot see in uh, in terms of like uh, art in art mm-hmm. they say that artistic ideas don't belong to the creator mm. you know they they belong to the world because they they can't be copyright for instance on yeah avalabacharya's you know tyagaraja's kritis or kabir's poetry mm. they can't be copyright because one is they don't they're not here anymore so even if we don't attribute we are not actually breaking any legal mm. uh, uh yes so but what do you think is in in this particular uh, comparison what were the ideas that were common and do you think they are uh, something that should be attributed uh so the most common base of uh, my whole research was based on the concept of dream so in gaudapada acharya's philosophy he says that there is very little or maybe no difference between the apparent waking state and dream state because in dream state everything feels real we feel all the emotions but the moment we wake up it's all gone so there is no saprayojanta there is no connection or harmony between the dream state and the real state it it completely changes for us right so what if this what we perceive as reality is nothing but a dream we will not know until we wake up from that and that waking up is the spiritual waking up or enlightenment or moksha or whatever so uh, he says that this might be different from the dream state because those two don't have connection between it but it's no different because ultimately you have to wake up yeah. from that and then everything is illusion alata chakravat so the way you light up a fire cracker and move it in the air and it creates an illusion hmm. the world is like that hmm. uh so he repeatedly says swapna vat swapna maya nagare swapna drishte and the film inception revolves around the idea of dream within a dream hmm. so the protagonist of the film uh, played by leonardo the caprio he goes into the subconscious hmm. mind of a subject hmm. uh 
the dreamer would create the world that is being dreamt and then that created world would be filled with the subconscious energy being the liveliness like when you see people in your dreams so those people are the projection of your mind mm. so that's what gaudapadacharya says that everything is projection of your mind mm. it's all created by the vibration of mind manah spandanam idam jagat so the whole world is a spandan a vibration mm. of the mind so uh, that was a basic idea and then there were some striking dialogues in the film that made me feel like no this has to be uh, looked into the dialogues that went something like uh, dreams have become their reality they don't come here to sleep they come here to wake up so the characters have lost the distinguishing line between the dreams and the reality so that felt like a representation or a katharsis of gaudapadacharya's philosophy because obviously the the pur- the purpose of the film is not to preach the philosophy it is to build an intense Correct. narrative so they have built a narrative around that philosophy but when we look at a different pers- look from a different perspective these film help in understanding the abstract ideas of philosophy because when you tell a layman that everything might be a dream of course they are not going to connect to that yeah. idea because i pinch you and it hurts so it's not a dream so when they uh, look at this philosophy through the lens of the film mm-hmm. they might be able to connect with that so my idea was to work upon uh, a two way that sanskrit scholars should be able to provide interesting narratives to the, the philosophy yeah. <laughs> and the non sanskrit people or the general audience of india or uh, foreign they should be able to explore indian philosophy through uh, the films like these yeah. i mean i think the film uh, medium hmm. is uh, so powerful true and uh, like even i think in yoga vashishta also hmm. we have hmm. the same yes, where yes. what what if what we are going through yes. now is the dream state yes, the dream state and the sleeping is uh, actually the waking i mean uh, can we uh, invert think so that we think differently not mm-hmm. not take knowledge mm. as it is you know in a linear way can mm. we try you know thinking looking at things in in loop yeah <laughs> correct and you know reverse loop yes. also yes. so uh, do you think that uh, through your public speaking mm-hmm. you know uh, do you find that younger audiences are uh, need a simpler retelling uh, to be to appreciate our uh, philosophy absolutely i do feel like uh, first of all we need simpler translations mm-hmm. the literal translations of the text because the critical editions mm-hmm. they are highly academic mm-hmm. in their language and tone so that critical editions are i don't think of any use to the common people you go to a bookstore and you don't find critical editions there so we need the the you know bhavanuvad more than the literal mm-hmm. anuvad of the text for general people that's one thing other uh, then that we need the media to be mm-hmm. included or involved it could be in any form like yeah. i'm speaking you shoot a video and we post it on social media that could be a media uh, or we could use audio books or something like that but we need the supportive tools to make yeah. it more interesting and more accessible because no one's going to sit for 3 hours and read yeah. the texts they might be uh traveling and listening to yeah, a podcast or something yeah. so yeah that that definitely needs to be done yeah. do you think that the uh, indian I- iks uh, mm. ecosystem uh including you know uh, scholars authors of uh, non uh, mm. i mean fiction and non fiction have been imaginative enough in capturing uh, this space whereas you see the west hmm. um if you see instagram for instance mm. they take the simplest of tools make it you know superly attractive true with the best video editing and graphics mm. uh even simple mantra chanting they are uh, monetizing it mm. uh, one is is it is it ethical uh, to do it i mean see the in modernity we have this crisis of ethics mm. how much of this wisdom make it attractive but are we making it attractive in order to commercialize it see uh i think making it attractive in order to commercialize it 
might be still okay but gate keeping it in order to commercialize it is the absolutely uh, wrong area like commercializing and making it sound attractive might be a morally gray zone <laughs> but gate keeping is purely the the black zone so i think if the west has been doing that if, even if indians have been doing that that's that's a doom to indian culture only if we need it to spread we need to spread it so uh, i think indians do need to make it a little more attractive mm-hmm. in a way it doesn't harm the essence yeah. of it because many a times we see that we make it sellable rather than attractive mm-hmm. so there is a difference between making something attractive and interesting and making it sellable yeah. because when we make it sellable we do leave some aspects of it out yeah. while making it attractive is only about enhancing the mm-hmm. beauty of what is already there so i think making it attractive through visuals or interesting storytelling or uh, different ways of putting out the story is very interesting but one thing gatekeeping is not done and another thing making it purely commercial you you feed what just people wants to see is also not done you have to show the spectrum of indian knowledge system and then let people explore it on their own so when we talk about uh, a modern india or a viksit mm-hmm. bharat um how how do you think we can take this knowledge forward so that the uh, country's development is enhanced um we're not talking you know we're not talking about the specific mm-hmm. knowledge how it mm-hmm. can be you know promoted or mm-hmm. patented or mm-hmm. uh, sold we talk about how does it impact the overall development in terms of changing the mindset and the ethical frameworks with which people operate in their day to day lives i think first of all indian knowledge system uh, i am I'm, i'm not uh, ex- experienced with all the states of uh, mm-hmm. india it might differ from state mm-hmm. to state or from region to region but sometimes i do feel that indian knowledge system for youth has just been about uh, karma kand so first of all that stereotype has to be broken that it is a wholesome knowledge system it would include our day to day lives it would include law it would include environment medicine everything so first of all that the aspect of indian knowledge system should be told in an interesting Entire. or connecting way to people that it is not just for the sanskrit scholars or oriental study scholars it is for everyone indian knowledge system is something we are born with because there are some fundamental things that we just know uh, for example there is there is a famous saying in gujarati which means that no kid ever listens to ramayan or mahabharat for the first time if they are born in india you will not remember when you heard the story of krishna for the first time it is just there within you so the way those things have been incorporated in us indian knowledge system has to be incorporated like the indian way of cooking is also indian knowledge system in a way indian way of dining is also indian knowledge system in a way so first of all that aspect has to be broadened and then i think uh, uh, including it in formal and informal education would help mm. like if the students from other fields be it stem the science math technology field be it the law be it the mbbs they if they are provided with something connected mm. to them it might be interesting because teaching vedanta to a law student will not help mm. we have to teach them chanakya niti or kautilya arthashastra so providing them with something that interests them would cater their need and i think that way we can uh, reciprocate the interest yeah see we have also the thought of mm. like uh, some people are stressing on sadhana mm. saying uh, all this knowledge is there mm. accessible mm. you're saying it's also within us but um, is the youth of today willing to put in the effort you know uh, the the what you know people in the traditional circles are also saying there should be a sadhana kant hmm. uh, without sadhana in kali yuga it is uh, we cannot access even if it is within us there is so much maya we are not able to touch it true so what is the role of sadhana in your life and what should be the sadhana in today's youngsters life to access this knowledge i'm i'm genuinely <laughs> curious about the definition of sadhana in this 
context so is it just about meditation or practicing yoga or is it in general about you know diving deeper into something i would you know in my opinion hmm. uh or in my experience uh sadhana can be anything that you put your mind hmm. and your uh, commitment to hmm. for a musician i have seen that so many hours of music yes absolutely. relates to and in indian hmm. uh, knowledge is i think you can use choose any path hmm. our our goal is the same hmm. that it is to reach a divine uh, True. source so that is my definition of whatever your path you choose you are willing to commit and you are willing to learn under you have the humility to seek a hmm. and uh, follow that path so is that youngster of today willing to do that i mean there for them the concept of guru unless they are in a traditional uh, learning uh, situation they don't believe in a guru hmm. they believe in a teacher hmm. and that too that is monetized you know so many huh. hours yeah so you know so uh, what would you say uh, for us to remove that kind of barrier or access to knowledge what is the sadhana that's easy today for the youngster um i think many youngsters are interested in pursuing that sadhana but the distractions are many around us so that might be one of the major uh, can issues. you give an example the, the very obvious example is our mobile phones like <laughs> when we are studying we cannot just sit for 2 hours and put the phone aside yeah. if it rings or if a notification pops in we just open the phone so i think that breaks the sadhana right Absolutely. there because our <laughs> mind has gone somewhere yeah. else so that, that has become our sadhana exactly sadhana. <laughs> exactly yeah. so uh, and even there we are not focused on one thing like i'm watching one ott platform and then i'm switching to instagram for a moment and then i'm back to the show that i was watching so even there we are not focused on yeah. one thing and i think we have so many data coming to us that that considering one person as a guru has become difficult mm -hmm. because one person is saying this the other person is saying that like in in, in indian culture we have grown up with eating a lot of sugar and desserts <laughs> and ghee and everything and then there will be people <laughs> saying okay yeah. cut the sugar cut the sugar yeah. so it's it's difficult to strike that balance yeah. and it's difficult to choose a theory in which you believe yeah. so first of all you choose a theory then you will choose a guru mm. because a guru will be someone who is expert in that theory or who has achieved the goal of mm. that theory so we are so scattered that we do not have our core belief system mm. it changes with the social media trends some things were cool 5 or 10 years back they are not cool anymore and uh, i think suddenly the indian philosophy has become cool again so i have like my fiance is a doctor mm. so i have a lot of doctors in my circle mm. and they all have been interested in indian philosophy and vedanta and they'll come to me that uh, radha tell us uh, mm. podcasts and things and they'll listen to those podcasts for like 2 3 hours a day mm. even during their hectic residency schedule mm. so i think the indian philosophy has become cool again so they are into it but for how long we don't know mm. so uh, keeping the the sadhana going on for yeah. years is the difficult task mm. i can set a 15 days schedule yeah. for my sadhana i can go to naturopathy camp yeah. and do some sadhana and focus on my physical and mental health but to continue their lifestyle has become difficult mm. for youth and i i really have no idea how we can generalize something in today's era because the city culture and the town culture are very different in india the state wise culture is very different in india and metro cities are in a completely different league <laughs> like they are beyond the understanding of town people so generalizing the youth's mentality would be difficult it needs to be studied you know in parts and bits like metropolitan mentality town culture mentality college mentality things like that so it, since you have been uh, focusing on gujarat hmm. and suppose we take gujarat as a model hmm. which uh, i think is a model in hmm. many ways for yeah. uh, the country uh, what do you think i mean they are probably the first to have you know vegetarianism they are uh, non uh, no alcohol yes uh, very satvik in their uh, approach so uh, is this you know uh, is gujarat different in some ways from the rest of the country in terms of being uh, you know uh, having a very unique model and uh, large masses following a model 
yes so vegetarianism prevails everywhere in gujarat and some things are very obvious for us like i studied my masters from pune university so i was in maharashtra for two days and suddenly uh, after shifting to pune after a month i realized that oh this is not a dry state mm-hmm. you can go to a restaurant and they would have alcohol mm-hmm. so it was shocking to me mm-hmm. because th- those are the very general beliefs that okay you cannot find alcohol on mm-hmm. streets and things like that of course i do not claim that we do not have mm-hmm. alcohol uh, uh, illegal things happen everywhere but uh, yeah certain things are very normal for us and i don't know how uh, you know other parts see it because my other non gujarati circle is mostly made of the sanskrit people who are anyway not into Correct. the yeah. uh, non traditional things for us so i don't know how others perceive gujarat but yeah for us it is a very peaceful calm uh, state uh we have shaivism there we have vaishnavism there we celebrate multiple festivals with multiple kind of religious beliefs and things go very well uh the youth there is not very well aware of the very rich heritage or the saint literature written in gujarati or things like that but i think it is becoming popular day by day in gujarat like in gujarat uh since last few years like last 3 mm. to 4 years we have had concerts of mm. gujarati folk music mm. so uh you might know a name due to instagram aditya gadvi who sang the goti lo to me goti lo that mm-hmm. so he does this concerts everywhere in gujarat even in foreign for gujarati people and the concerts are completely non bollywood or non filmy they are mm. purely focused on traditional gujarati songs folk songs saint literature things like that we have other artists who perform uh, saint literature of gujarati and non gujarati kabir das ji meera bai ji mm-hmm. their poetry so these things are becoming popular and people are paying more than they would pay for bollywood films fantastic so so that is something i'm very proud of yeah. and i hope it grows <laughs> more in the future mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious about one more thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm part of a group that's doing a research on mm. uh, called Onnamalu mm. that's researching the food traditions of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Mm. So they are going from district to district mm. and uh, documenting what is the main food mm. cuisine. Uh, is it something that's inherited from mm. you know, and is it based on certain growing conditions? So in Gujarat, has the food changed over time, or you know, people have? Uh, retain their culinary traditions and their uh, cooking styles and their eating habits has that uh, changed or how is it in gujarat uh it has not changed much like our day to day homemade food is same since generations at least 3 to 4 generations but yeah fast food has been added to our lives and the consumption is mm-hmm. obviously growing like mm-hmm. any other state but the traditional gujarati food has remained the same and i think the new generation is in love with mm-hmm. that as well like the the very stereotypical food all those stereotypes i assure you that they are correct we do not travel without thesla <laughs> we eat a lot of uh, phapda gaathiya khafra and those things you know the thali the gujarati the gujarati thali is also very traditional thing and yeah when we have guests coming over we have like two sabjis one kathol sprout or something one or two farsan one or two sweets it's very common in gujarat to have you know a full yeah. thali meal <laughs> that you are not able to stuff in one <laughs> setting uh a new generation is in love with that as well so i think that's not going away for a long time <laughs> sure you know you are you're very charming and uh, it's amazing to see somebody so happy inside and out so Thank what is so the much. secret of your uh, cheer and your well being is it your uh, <laughs> spiritual journey or is... it might be one of the reasons one thing i, I personally am very happy is my <laughs> personal and professional life that is a very obvious vyavharik yeah. reason other than that i have been studying vedan for so long yeah. that somewhere it has it has been rooted into me that everything is illusion so who cares <laughs> no that that's so, so cool <laughs> so that yeah. that might be one of the reasons so i do not claim that i have reached any you know spiritual heights or something it might be a conditioning because you read something repeatedly Absolutely. i'm pursuing my phd in this so i spent hours reading existential stuff <laughs> so there was a phase where yeah. i i felt that what's the point of everything and it was a little 
set backing but now i'm like okay anyway there's no <laughs> point no. of anything so i can just chill around yeah uh and yeah my my ecosystem is very supportive and sweet so my family my in-laws my everything is well so wonderful wishing you all the very best and such a pleasure such a pleasure thank to you so meet much. somebody so inspiring thank you namaste